Lawrence Joseph Bader, known to his friends and family as Larry, was a cookware salesman for the Reynolds Metals Corporation in Akron, Ohio. Born December 2, 1926, Larry would be wed to Mary Lou Knapp, and the couple would go on to have three children. At the time of Larry's disappearance, Mary was pregnant with their fourth child. Besides supporting a growing family, Larry was under the stress of over $20,000 of debt and was in trouble with the IRS. On March 15, 1957, the father, seemingly unaffected by the predictions for intense weather that day, rented a 14-foot motorboat, kissed his pregnant wife Mary Lou goodbye, and went to sail on Lake Erie in order to go fishing. At around 4.30 p.m., he pushed off in the rented vessel, never to be seen again. The next day, after a considerable storm over the lake, which the Coast Guard later said nobody was likely to survive, Larry's motorboat was found. The Coast Guard noted on their report that the boat had minor damage and was missing an oar. Despite an extensive search, Larry was nowhere to be found. As no body was ever recovered from the rough waters, the family was left to assume the worst, and they began to work to make ends meet in the husband and father's abrupt absence. Four days later, unbeknownst to anyone in Ohio, John Fritz Johnson made his first appearance. Those later interviewed say they first remember meeting Fritz at a local joint called Round Table Bar in Omaha, Nebraska. Witnesses recall that Fritz immediately attracted attention by volunteering to sit on a flagpole for 30 days in order to raise money for polio. The gregarious man, eventually known for his flamboyant personality, grew in popularity throughout Omaha. Eventually, Fritz would become the town's radio announcer and then a well-known TV sports director at KETV7. In line with his on-air personality, Fritz lived an equally colorful bachelor lifestyle. Those who lived in the same town as Fritz recall with amusement his choice of car, a hearse. Not only was his hearse a sight to behold from the outside, it was equally fantastic within, equipped with pillows, a bar, and an incense burner. Locals remember Fritz referring to his hearse as his, quote, hunting vehicle, in the sense that he claimed he used it to seduce women. In 1961, roughly four years after making his debut appearance, Fritz would marry Nancy Zimmer, a 20-year-old divorcee. He would later adopt her daughter. Later, they together had a son. In 1964, doctors discovered that Fritz had a cancerous tumor behind his left eye. He lost the eye, but proudly wore an eye patch. One witness even said that such a setback only added to his flamboyance and infectious spirit, and fondly says that he proudly donned the eye patch as just another one of his accessories. On February 2nd, 1965, Fritz, who, like the missing Larry, was an archery enthusiast, attended a tournament in Chicago. While at the event, an acquaintance from Akron, Ohio, saw him, and despite the thin mustache and eye patch, knew he recognized the man. He knew him, though, not as Fritz the TV personality, but as Larry the family man, lost at sea more than seven years prior, a man who had now been declared legally deceased. While the likeness was personally obvious, he guided over Larry's own 21-year-old niece, Suzanne Pika, to take in what now to both of them was a shocking sight. After regarding the man in front of her, who was talking to retailers in front of him, the 21-year-old noticed that aside from the eye patch and the style of the man's hair, he looked exactly like her uncle, Lawrence Bader. Convinced, she asked him, quote, pardon me, but aren't you my uncle Larry Bader who disappeared seven years ago? The pair recalls that the man initially laughed it off. However, not deterred by the man's denial, Suzanne called in his two brothers from Akron, Ohio to investigate further. While the man they thought was Larry denied up and down that he had ever even been to Akron, much less was a former resident, the brother's insistence led his fingerprints to be compared with Larry Bader's own military records. They matched. The man with many names was now faced with the fact that all of his memories were false and that he now had two wives. Larry's reappearance caused many problems for his first wife, Mary Lou. She had been receiving $254 monthly from Social Security. She'd also already received $39,500 from Larry's life insurance policy. Now that it was discovered Larry was alive, that would also have to be paid back. To complicate matters further, Mary Lou had since been dating and had recently accepted a marriage proposal. 
With her marriage to Larry now reinstated, her new marriage would be impossible as she was Catholic and divorce to her was not an option. Since Bader's reappearance, his marriage to Nancy was regarded as legally null and void. However, she claimed that she would still stick by him. A team of psychiatrists examined the man they now called Larry again for over 10 days. Their conclusion was that he had no recollection of his former life. However, some doubted this convenient amnesia. There was evidence in his past that Larry may have wanted to start again. He was from a well-to-do family and had never needed money prior to going into debt. Later on, he would try various get-rich-quick schemes, which failed. He flunked his first semester at the University of Akron because he concentrated more on his hamburger stand than his studies. As an adult, he barely made enough money to maintain the lifestyle that he was used to, and because of that, he got into trouble with the IRS, trying to save money by not paying taxes. For those reasons, some wondered if Larry had faked his death in order to escape from the chains of financial stress that were holding him down. According to psychologists, cases of amnesia lasting several years, in which the person filled the missing time with false memories, are rare but not unheard of. Another theory was that the tumor behind his eye may have been responsible for Larry's apparent memory loss. This, however, was never officially determined. The man said of his own personal mental journey, quote, it was like a physical shock. Up until that moment, I had no doubt that I was not Larry Bader. But when I heard that, it was like a door had been slammed and somebody had hit me right in the face. The malignant tumor, which cost Larry his eye and possibly his memories, eventually resurfaced. Larry, known to some now as Fritz, died on September 16, 1966, at St. Joseph's Medical Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. His death meant that the now popular question of whether he was an amnesiac, a schizophrenic, suffering from multiple personalities, or was just a con man trying to start again, has never been adequately resolved. In 2012, Anton Filippo was 39 years old, struggling to find the proper resources and support for his continued mood swings. A resident of Toronto, Canada, his family had worked tirelessly to get Anton the support and treatment he needed. So far, they had been unsuccessful. That past year, back in January of 2011, Anton was involved in an altercation and charged with assault and weapons offenses. However, he would mysteriously vanish prior to his court date. He was last seen in Scarborough in 2012. After he disappeared, his family notified police and tried to spread the word, checking shelters, jails, and morgues for any trace of him. However, the search turned up no leads, and his family feared the worst. Five years later, on November 28, 2017, Anton Filippa, now in his mid-40s, was found wandering a Brazilian highway by the Brazilian Highway Police. He was found on a road near Manus, the largest city in the Amazon. Authorities recalled the man was confused, swearing, and unable to speak Portuguese. He initially struggled to communicate his identity to the four police officers who arrived on the scene. At one point, he mentioned that he was from Victoria, British Columbia, and asked for the RCMP. Comments which caught the attention of a Canadian-born officer, who then contacted the Canadian Embassy. Authorities posted a photo of the man on Facebook and on Twitter to seek help in identifying him. While the search for him was still ongoing, the Canadian Embassy identified him officially as Anton Filippa and notified his brother Stefan in Toronto. In the meantime, police were unable to hold Anton in custody as he had not committed a crime, so he was transferred to a nearby hospital, from which he ran away on December 8, 2017, slipping out of the grasp of his alarmed family. Highway police then received a tip on Christmas Day of 2017 that a man matching Anton's description was spotted on a section of the highway adjacent to the Amazon rainforest. Authorities commented on the danger Anton was in. Quote, Here's where we really started to fear for his safety, because up there, big predators like alligators, snakes, among other deadly animals, are real. We are talking about the Amazon jungle. Anton was finally found on January 3, 2018, and Stefan flew down to Brazil to reunite with his brother. Stefan had set up a successful GoFundMe campaign in order to raise money for Anton's return. He described his brother as, quote, a longtime anti-poverty activist and member of radical communities in Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto on the fundraising page. 
When questioned about his brother's mysterious and abrupt departure, Stefan explained that Anton had embarked on this bizarre journey from his Vancouver home in order to get to the National Library of Buenos Aires in Argentina. A former humanitarian worker himself, his goals were often sought in areas far bigger than his own backyard. And while his specific motivations for trekking to the National Library were unknown, his brother supposes it was to help others in some capacity, although he concurs that mental illness also played its part. Despite being mistaken for a beggar due to his appearance, Anton traveled through at least 10 countries, including the United States, Mexico, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, and Brazil. Covering a distance of more than 10,000 kilometers on foot, Anton made this nomadic journey without a passport and with only the clothes on his back. When he finally reached the National Library of Buenos Aires, the now haggard traveler was turned away as he had no form of identification. He continued on his way to Brazil, where he was eventually located and subsequently returned home. During his journey, he says he survived by foraging for fruits and berries, scavenging food and clothing from rubbish piles, and receiving help from kind strangers. While passing through the Amazon jungle, he miraculously avoided poisonous snakes and spiders, but he did lose all 10 of his toenails in the perilous journey due to injury and infection. Stefan says his brother still struggles with mental illness and is currently receiving treatment for schizophrenia and living in Toronto. Anton, speaking to BBC Brazil, told the reporter that he was happy to be found. He said he, quote, never felt alone and that he encountered more generous people than, quote, bad ones. Anton told the interviewer, quote, I know that I am very lucky to be alive. I am very happy to be able to return to my family. Lula Gillespie Miller was a 28-year-old woman living in Laurel, Indiana. In 1974, Lula vanished from her home after giving birth to her fourth child. According to Lula's daughter, Tammy Miller, Lula had led a troubled life. She was involved with alcohol and had been dealing with the death of her husband from a tragic car accident. Tammy was born in 1971, and according to her, she was born as a result of her mother's extramarital affair. Lula's other three children were from her late husband. According to Tammy, in 1973, her mother had been assaulted and was thrown over a bridge. Lula was able to survive and alerted the authorities. The police took her statement, but an official report was never filed. Lula disappeared the next day. Lula was reported missing by her family, however, no trace of her could ever be found. While her family says she went missing in 1973, police reports state that she was not officially declared missing until 1974. Prior to her disappearance, Lula had given custody of all four of her children to the mother of her deceased husband. Tammy and her three half-siblings were raised by their grandmother, Catherine. In 1975, the family would receive a letter from Lula, which was sent from Richmond, Indiana. However, there was no further communication from her after that, and the family assumed that she had passed away. Lula's mother, Emma Gillespie, held out hope that her daughter would eventually be found. Lula's daughter, in an interview, said of her grandmother, quote, she always left her porch light on every night because she always thought that Lula was going to come home. She never stopped doing it. The grandmother died in 2014 at the age of 91 without ever knowing what happened to her daughter. In 2010, Tammy was searching her mother's name online and came across an article. In the article, she learned of her mother's assault in 1974. This caught her attention, and she started looking for answers. She contacted the Doe Network, as well as local authorities, and in 2014, Indiana State Police Detective Sergeant Scott Jarvis began formally investigating the case. Sergeant Jarvis looked into the 1975 letter that the family had received, purportedly from Lula, and contacted the Richmond Police. They told him that an unidentified woman had been found deceased in 1975 in a sewer. The woman's body was exhumed and her DNA was collected. A DNA test, however, revealed that she was not Lula. Soon, Sergeant Jarvis was able to find a different lead. During his investigation, Jarvis discovered records of a woman who looked similar to Lula living in Tennessee in the 1980s prior to relocating to Texas. 
After digging deeper, he eventually found a woman living in a small South Texas town since the 1990s, and while her name did not match the missing woman's, many of her features did. In March of 2016, Sergeant Jarvis contacted the woman and she confirmed that her real name was in fact Lula Gillespie Miller and that she was originally from Laurel, Indiana. However, Lula did not give any explanation as to why she left her children and her life behind. According to reports, Lula wondered why people were even still looking for her. Authorities have not revealed her assumed name to the media as that would violate her privacy. Lula, however, did give police permission to share the information with her daughter. Tammy eventually called her mother, and they had a brief conversation over the phone, but it was cut short after less than two minutes. Lula allegedly told her daughter that she would call back when she could actually talk. However, Tammy did not believe that her mother would actually follow through, and was correct. Following the disappointing phone call, Tammy has decided not to continue searching for her mother. While she's relieved to know that her mother is still alive, it's far too painful for her to accept that it was her mother's own decision to abandon all four of her children. In 2002, Pennsylvania mother Brenda Heist vanished after dropping off her 9 and 11 year old children at school. While Brenda had been experiencing multiple life stressors, such as a divorce, and had also recently been turned down for financial housing assistance, those close to her were fearful something terrible had happened to her as they believed she would never abandon her children. The day she disappeared, loved ones discovered a turkey defrosting on the kitchen counter for dinner that night and a load of laundry only halfway done. Friends and family were insistent that Brenda would never have left her children voluntarily. A police investigation ensued under the guise that Brenda may have been a victim of foul play at the hands of her ex-husband or another predator. It appeared to everyone that Brenda had disappeared without a trace and there were no viable leads. Brenda's car was found in a neighboring county, but no meaningful evidence was gathered and no further leads emerged. Suspicion fell to Brenda's husband, Lee Heist, who was eventually cleared by law enforcement. In the meantime, Lee and the children struggled financially and even lost their home. Lee raised their now adult children, although he continued to live under a cloud of suspicion for years within the community. Lee had Brenda declared legally dead in 2010 and has since remarried. To the shock and dismay of both authorities and Brenda's family, in 2013, the missing mother, now 54 years old, suddenly reappeared. She turned herself in to the sheriff's department in Key Largo, Florida, and informed them that she was a missing person. She later explained that on the day of her disappearance, back in 2002, Heist had stopped at a local park after dropping her children off at school. She struck up a conversation with several people at the park who noticed that she was sobbing. They then invited her to join them as they hitchhiked around the country. On a whim, the mother of two decided to join them. Since then, she has been living a vagrant lifestyle, panhandling, hitchhiking, living under bridges, and in tent cities. Recently, she was arrested under a false name. Brenda's confession brought an end to her missing persons case, which had gone cold in the later years, but only brought a beginning to her later life problems. Those close to the family report on the fact that Brenda's relationship with her children, now adults, are incredibly strained. The children refuse to converse with her, and her ex-husband Lee Heist is furious at his ex-wife for the financial and emotional turmoil she caused in his and their children's lives. Brenda feels a great deal of shame and remorse for her actions, according to a Pennsylvania detective who interviewed her after her reappearance, and goes on to say that while she is physically back, she has a long way to go to make things right. In these uncertain times, a special thanks to all of our patrons for their continued support. You can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash 7 or just search Patreon Merc. 